the thing that as a historian that strikes me about these um, documents is first how mundane they are, how banal they are, uh, how similar they are to the kinds of the book of receipts that you could pick up today. But then to realize that the people that are kind of in this kind of elegant handwriting that are signing their names to this receipt are engaged um, in the sale of humans. This particular receipt from Baltimore, dated in 1851, uh, warrants and defense against the claims of all persons whatsoever, and likewise warrants sound and healthy and slaves for life. Uh, so it's, it's almost identical, but it adds the little phrase, and slaves for life, uh, that none of the others do. And so you ask yourself, well, what might account for uh, that little bit of fine print, that little legal boilerplate being added uh, to this receipt? People keep records of uh, property uh, in a way that they don't keep of people. Uh, and they lay these records uh, stay around with us for a long time. You often will hear that, well, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't, you know, didn't free any slaves really, because it only uh, it only uh, was under effect for those areas that uh, weren't under the control of the Union Army. But what it did do was take this huge uh, amount of capital that was uh, invested in slaves and wiped it out. It just erased uh, billions of dollars of capital. And it's one of the reasons that New York City was such a hotbed of pro-slavery sentiment, because the, you know, the banks and the, and the, and the uh, trading houses in New York City were very invested economically.